Hello, I'm Father Benedict Groeschel of the Franciscan Friars of the Renewal from the South Bronx. And this is our 12th segment in our series, Prayer in the New Catechism of the Catholic Church. And today we're going to tackle the toughest subject of all. We've spoken about many kinds of prayer, and especially Christian prayer, meditation, but we're going to take a little stab at saying something about contemplative prayer or contemplation. Now, this word obviously means something special, something different, something out of the ordinary. Uh, There are very, very few people in the world who could with any honesty say that they're always in a period of contemplative awareness of God. My humble impression is that they wouldn't survive very long if they were. Contemplation is a powerful experience of the presence and action of God. And it can come in two ways. It can come by dint of a person's getting themselves together and ready, persevering in prayer when they want to quit, leading a good life, making sacrifices, and perhaps, as Cardinal Newman says, when the din of life is hushed, when things calm down, they may gradually experience more and more a warm glow of the presence of God in life. You meet such people and they are very advanced in the spiritual life. Sometimes the spiritual writers use of them the expression, they live in union with God. I have known a few such people in my life, and they were very impressive. Some of the ones I knew are now proposed for beatification and canonization as saints of the church. Others are totally unknown, but no less friends of God. Then there's another kind of contemplation which they call infused contemplation. It pours out on a person rather suddenly. It's not expected. It's not earned in any way. But the individual has to be permanently open to it. And I'm sure that if it happened to most people too often, they would become very proud. They would begin to think, think, that this was themselves doing this, and consequently, God would never give them such a book, such a gift. Our Lord speaks of such a thing in the Gospel of St. John. You've heard these words before, but just think for the moment what they really mean. Jesus said, John 14, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him, and we will come to him, and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. The word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. We will come to him, and we will make our abode with him, our home with him. Now, how can that be? that God would be with a person. Well, the actual fact is that it doesn't happen in some big sudden thing and last forever, but it happens now and then, in a split second, in the twinkling of an eye. Rarely, and usually only when a person is very purified, sometimes by misfortune and loss. A person to be led to this kind of contemplation has to surrender everything. And we saw indications that in the last moment of her life, St. Therese of Lisieux had such an experience. We're really out of what most people can experience or comment upon. And we have to rely completely on the Holy Spirit. Jesus continues, right after that passage about he and the Father will come, these things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things 
and bring to your remembrance what I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. This is something extremely unusual. And whoever you are, if you are leading the best devout Christian life you can, which means you're putting up with a lot of stuff. To lead a devout Christian life in this world, you put up with a lot. And you're not complaining and not belly aching all the time. You're carrying your cross. You should believe that it is possible that you might come very close to God. Or rather, I should say, that he might come very close to you on an occasion. It might not last very long, but it might come back. And this would not be of your doing. So there is the contemplation that is acquired by leading a good, devout, quiet, generous life. And there's the contemplation that comes like thunder and lightning. At least, if you're interested, be convinced that it could happen. And in order for this to happen, you cannot place any obstacle in the way of God. You can't say, well, I'll do anything but this, or I'll do anything but that, or I've got to have the other thing. You may have things, but you have to say, I will not hold on to that. If God needs it, God wants me to lose it, God wants me to give it up, I will. Contemplation is the pearl of great price, which as Jesus says, a man, when he found it, he went and he sold everything that he had in order that he might buy it. It is the treasure hidden in the field. And when the man found it, he sold all his possessions to buy the field. Now, If you don't put obstacles in the way of God, there is one other thing you have to do, and that is be sure that you don't make a contract with God or try to make one. You've got to give this to me. Many of you saw the movie years ago, Song of Bernadette. It's a very good movie. And in it, there is a nun, Merizard, a good nun, who is very angry because Bernadette, this little peasant girl, had the mystical vision, and she didn't. She couldn't. She had too many obstacles in the way of God, and the biggest obstacle was her great, big, fat ego. I've got to do it. The word I almost has to drop out of your vocabulary before God can get too close. God never forces us. We all stand there like this with our hands tightly gripped on what we think we have. And if we can just release our grip a little bit, God will put something in it. We all say to Christ, as the apostle said, we've left everything. What are we going to have? What are we going to have? Us. We're we're all terribly self-centered. And God, who is infinite, cannot come to us in such a situation. There are, in the literature of the world, several descriptions of contemplation, infused contemplation. And I'm going to read you one from the writings of St. Augustine. This is a little book I published with Crossroads, the major spiritual writings of St. Augustine. And this is what is called the episode at the window in Ostia. St. Augustine had finally been converted, his mother's prayers were fulfilled. He had been baptized with his son by St. Ambrose in the Cathedral of Milan, and they were journeying back to North Africa where they lived. Monica never got back. She died in Rome on her way back, and she's buried in Rome in the church of St. Augustine. They were down by the harbor, which is called Ostia, right outside of Rome, resting for their sea voyage to Africa. And um, while they were there, an event took place. And if I can ask you, relax, shut out any distractions. If there's somebody out in the kitchen right now, tell them to close the door. Somebody else is playing music, just say, 
calm down, quiet down. I want to listen to this. Get yourself wide awake, sit in the chair, gather yourself, your thoughts in, and let me read to you the most impressive description of a contemplative experience shared by two people, a mother and her son. When this happened, Augustine was a new convert. He was not yet a bishop. And his mother and he were talking about what the eternal life of the saints might be like. Monica was filled with joy because she had prayed for her son all those years. And he got worse and worse and finally he had been created. And they were talking in deep joy, forgetting the things that were behind and looking forward to those that were. And we were discussing in the presence of truth, which you are, O Lord, what the eternal life of the saints might be like, which eye has not seen nor ear heard. And with the mouth of our heart, we panted for the high waters of your heavenly fountain, that fountain of life which is with you, that being sprinkled from that fountain, according to our capacity, we might, in some sense, meditate on so great a thing. And our conversation brought us to this point, that any pleasure whatsoever of the bodily senses and any brightness whatsoever of corporeal light seem to us not worthy of comparison with the pleasure of that eternal light, not worthy even of mention. And rising as our love flamed upwards, Toward that self-same reality, we passed in review all the levels of bodily things up to the heavens themselves where the sun and the moon and the stars shine. And we went beyond the heavens, soaring and thinking with our minds and speaking and marveling of your work. And so we came to our own souls and we went beyond them to that region of riches unending where you feed Israel forever with the food of truth. Their life is that wisdom by which all things are made, things which have been, things which are yet to be. But this wisdom is not made. It always has been and ever shall be. And while we were thus speaking of your wisdom and panting for it, with all the effort of our heart, we did for one instant, for the twinkling of an eye, attain to touch it, and sighing and leaving our hearts there, we return to the sound of our tongue, where a word has beginning and end. And so we said to each other, if to anyone the tumultuous noise of the flesh grew silent, silent the images of earth and sea and sky, if the soul grew silent to herself, and all things grew silent, and in that silence he spoke to us, not by them but by himself, so that we could hear his word, not uttered by tongue of flesh or voice of angel or sound of thunder or darkness of parable but we should hear him who is in all these things we love, hear him and not them, just as we had in an instant touched on that eternal wisdom. If this could continue and all other experiences so inferior be taken away and this one so wrap the beholder in inward joys that all of life would become like that one moment, Would this not mean enter into the joy of the Lord? And when shall it be? Shall it not be when we shall all be raised and we shall be changed? True contemplation, this is, that's St. Augustine now, this is me. True contemplation is a single instance perhaps a little bit longer, 
when we see some of the endless day of eternity. It could happen to you. I know very simple people that it has happened to. I know profound and educated people it has happened to. I know people who have found God in different ways and his grace has reached out to them and it has happened to them. Don't expect even the best of spiritual lives to be like that. The best of spiritual lives is carrying the cross, doing what you're supposed to do, not looking around for this. One day someone came to Mother Teresa and they said, Mother Teresa, when was the last time you had an experience of God? And she said, it's so long ago, I don't remember it. What she was trying to tell them is that you don't carry the cross for this, but God gives it to us. I am convinced that great numbers of people could have contemplative experiences of God if they followed the gospel as best they could, if they avoided sin and were generous and did good and trusted God where they were led and to what they were led, they would find him. In the Hebrew Bible it says, you shall seek me and you shall find me when you shall seek me with all your heart. It has been said by those who have found God in this world that everything else pales away to a shadow. But oddly enough, these are also the people who are most interested in God and in the world around them at the same time. We're not surprised they're interested in God, but these are vital people. Mother Teresa, she's a very vital person, goes all over the world. They fulfill whatever vocation they have, housewife or real estate agent or garage mechanic or clergyman or teacher or whatever it happens to be. When I work with the very homeless, once in a while I have found somebody who actually had an experience of contemplation who was a poor homeless man. More than once, more than ten times, I have spoken to homeless men, people who are ill, seriously disturbed, confused, but in the middle of it all they can stop and talk to you and they reach beyond that all, and you know that they know something about God. It's quite amazing. Two centuries ago, there was a young man from a devout farmer family. He wanted to be a priest. He wanted to be a monk. He lived in France. And it was an awful time in France. It was the eve of the revolution. Everything was a mess. Some people were very devout. Some people were very, very worldly, within the church and outside the church. And so he set out from home to join the strictest of orders, the, the Trappists. And he never made it, never succeeded. A profound depression would descend upon him in a few weeks. It was amazing. He wanted nothing more than to be a Trappist monk. He was well enough educated that he could have been a priest in the order, but he couldn't do it. The last monastery he went to is one called Septfon, the Monastery of the Seven Fountains. And he was there six weeks, and the darkness descended upon him. And he left and he traveled to the small town of Paré, Paré le Monial. And in that town, a hundred years before, the cloistered nun, Margaret Mary Alacoque, had seen the vision of Christ with his heart burning and visible, the vision of the Sacred Heart. The chapel was there. People knew about this vision. It was already becoming popular 
in Catholic devotion. And so he went there, and he made a complete act of trust in Christ. Sacred heart of Jesus, I place my trust in you. From there he wrote a letter to his parents that he was going down over the Alps to try to enter a monastery in Italy. But perhaps he would never be a monk. Same thing happened in Italy. He did not know what to do, so he became a pilgrim. He would live among the poor, sleeping in the arches of the Colosseum during the winter, praying many hours in church before the Eucharist. The janitor of one of those churches swore later on in his cause of beatification that he used to wait to sweep the church till the afternoon when this man would be lifted up above the ground and he would sweep underneath him. Only a Roman sacristan could be that blasé. And when he would celebrate Easter in Rome and then he would go walk up to Assisi to the shrine of St. Francis, up into the Alps of the shrine of Our Lady of Einsiedeln, and then across, down along the coast of France, up into the Pyrenees, and to the shrine of St. James at Compostela. And in the fall, he would walk back. There are still inns in southern France where there are signs that this man stayed there. He looked to most people like a hobo, but those who looked at him carefully realized there was something very special about him. He stayed in a barn one time of a French farmer. The farmer had 17 children. And in the morning, the farmer was so impressed that he lined up the kids and he said, say a prayer over my family. And as he was leaving, this vagabond, this homeless man, touched the head of the smallest boy and gave him a special prayer. That boy's name was Matthew Vianney, and he would be the grandfather of St. John Vianney, the Curie of Ars. And the family would remember this man. Finally, in Holy Week, he collapsed in the church of Our Lady of the Mountain in Rome. And a barber named Zaccarella picked him up and carried him into the house because everybody thought he was a saint. He spent many, many hours in prayer. He would ask for food and share it with the other homeless. Zacharella put him in bed. It was the first time he was in bed in 14 years. And he died. The word went out through the city. The saint is dead. The saint didn't know him. Great crowds came. The papal soldiers had to be called out to restore order. And there in the crowd was a man in a long black cape with a tricorner hat. A gentleman. And the papal soldiers made room for the gentleman. And he came up to the casket. He was a Protestant minister. He had heard of this strange, bizarre superstition, this hobo. And he stopped at the edge of the open casket and he became a Catholic. Nobody can explain it. This man belonged to one of the most prominent families in the United States. His uncle was the founder of West Point Academy, General Thayer. And this man was the first Protestant minister to be ordained a Catholic priest in the history of the United States, John Thayer. The next morning he was buried. And if you go to Rome now, and you go to the Church of Our Lady of the Mountain, Santa Maria dei Monti, and you walk around the corner on the building at number two on that street, there is a sign. Into this building on the 16th of April, 1785, was carried the dying beggar, Benedict Joseph Labre. And it has the date of his beatification and canonization. And underneath are the words, How blessed 
are the poor in spirit. A strange and mysterious vocation. When he was canonized, Pope Benedict said, he's admirable, but don't imitate him. Because he was ill. I work with the ill, the homeless mentally ill. And we have there a picture of him in our shelter because he's their saint. You become a saint on your own? No. You become a saint because you are open to God. Whatever there was of this little man, died in his early 30s, whatever there was, he gave to God. He could pray by the hour. He could kneel in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament hours on end. Perhaps he's one of the great contemplatives of, of, of the human race. Who knows? Who knows? But he is living proof of what St. Paul says, that the poor things of this world has God chosen, the things that were nothing, the things that were not, in order that he might bring to naught those that are, that no flesh might glory in his sight. The Second Vatican Council decreed clearly a teaching that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are given without regard to rank. They are given to those whom God chooses to give them to. The person who was Pope at the time of St. Benedict Joseph is not a saint. Can't blame him. The cardinals were not saints. It was the time of the American Revolution. None of those people are saints. But this man is a saint. St. Benedict Joseph. We've just started a little guild for the mentally ill and their relatives. And if you write to me, I'll get around to sending you a nice brochure for someone that you know who may be emotionally troubled and who may not know what in the world there is for them. But even for them, there is the presence of God in prayer. Thank you.